And now, conversations with historians. John Miller meets several eminent historians to discuss their work, why they were drawn to it, and why they feel it's relevant to the modern world. It was always David Starkey's ambition to become an historian, and it was studying under Geoffrey Elton at Cambridge that influenced his choice of period. He currently teaches Tudor history at the London School of Economics. He's the author of a number of books on the Tudors, is now writing a major biography of Henry VIII, and was historical advisor to the hugely successful recent exhibition Henry VIII, A European Court in England, which marked the 500th anniversary of Henry's birth. For me, and for thousands of visitors, he brought the 16th century alive. So what's his key to understanding the Tudor period? To recognise how different they are from us and how similar. I think this is always what a historian has got to do. And what they are is something I think we have very fundamentally forgotten. They're an essentially aristocratic society. And their values are the values of an aristocratic society. So that means things like rank and precedence and order. A completely forgotten world, a world which was already fading by the Second World War and was completely obliterated by the 1960s. And it survives, I suppose, in the darker corners, corners of young fogedom. But apart from that, not at all. And somehow one's got to recover that world of order and precedence and aristocracy. Did the overthrow of Richard III at Bosworth Field mark a watershed in our history? Historians always say yes and no. <laughs> I'm going to say yes and no. I think in some ways it did more than a recent generation of historians has, th uh, has thought. Now, if you'd asked me if we'd been on... Um, uh, BBC in the reign of Queen Victoria. In some ways, one feels that the BBC really does belong to the reign of Queen Victoria. If we'd been on the BBC in the reign of Queen Victoria, there would have been no doubt. I would have known that modern times began in 1485. I think what the Tudors do is alter the pattern of relationships between the king and the governing class. And in fact, the Tudors really rule England with a kind of royal party. And you get the same sort of parallelism in structure, in government, as you used to do in the old Soviet system. You have a formal structure of government, and you have an informal structure of government in the one, Russia, the party, in Tudor England, the followers of the Tudor king. Henry VII made a number of changes of style, which turned out to be changes of substance in, in the way he governed. Why did he convert his privy chamber from what you've called a vast bed sit? I think Henry recognises the need to do two things. He recognises the need to make the nobility and the great forces in the country dependent on him, but also to stop them having too close or too intimate access to him. In other words, you want them there, but you also want to be able to hold them off. And what he does is to redefine, if you like, privacy. He says, there will be a barrier around me, and you will not be able to go beyond that barrier unless you belong to this tiny little group of servants, the servants of my privy chamber, who have access there. Why was the groom of the stool so important? Ah, what a funny title that is. It's that very inelegant instrument, a close stool or a commode, and the groom was actually in charge of the royal lavatory. Uh, they certainly were responsible for sort of carrying it around from palace to palace, uh, for repair costs to it, for making sure that all the swans down stuffing and whatever was in place and that the fringing and whatever in good order. They also, I think, officiated when the king actually used it. In other words, it is literally the most intimate of body servants and body service. And this brings us, I think, again, right at the beginning, we said, we have to explore difference. One of the things that separates us from our ancestors is the idea of personal service. The more important you were, the less you did for yourself. The more was done for, for you. Your shirt was put on, your drawers were pulled on, your um, hose was pulled on, your shoes were fastened for you, you were shaved. And to understand their world, I think we need to understand this extraordinary intimacy of service. And the king's confidant was the groom of the stool, was his closest personal servant, who's also private secretary, private treasurer, intimate political advisor, and patronage secretary. You said there was nothing lovable about Henry the Seventh. There's a wonderful story told by Francis Bacon that he actually kept a list of everybody's peccadilloes so it could all be turned against them. And he actually had a book in which everyone's problems were recorded. And this wonderful tale told by um, 
uh, Francis Bacon, that his, his favourite pet monkey one day was discovered having broken into the privy chamber and torn up the book and was sort of eating it. And you know, the entire court rejoices as this essential machinery of oppression is destroyed. So Henry is like that, and more seriously, of course, he imposes very strict financial controls on the nobility, people who had not been used to control, and they resent that. So when he dies... 1509, his death is greeted with near open celebration. And you do so, of course, by praising his heir, his successor, Henry VIII, but also denigrating, criticising him. And one of the most famous of early Tudor Englishmen, Thomas More, is later on actually accused of being a traitor to Henry VII because of all the rude things that he said about him. Thomas More's poem at the um, coronation of Henry VII's son actually went so far as to say, this day is the end of our slavery. That's putting it a bit strong, isn't it? Thomas More usually put things strong. I Presumably that, that's what makes you a saint, you know, that, 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 that capacity for romantic exaggeration, including romantic exaggeration of the self. What More is doing there, of course, is using apocalyptic language. Each new reign is a new world, and you use, in fact, techniques which are very much like those of a modern government replacing a fallen government. If you remember in those dim and distant uh, days of Howard Wilson, there was the attack on 13 years of Tory misrule. Well, it's very much the same with Henry VIII. He's quite deliberately repudiating his father's style. He is saying, I am going to be different. I am going to be chivalric. He's playing up the fact, again, just as happened in the 1960s, that he's young. He is, after all, only 17 years and 10 months. He's deliberately playing up the contrast between him as the spring prince and his father as, if you like, the winter king. There's a change of generations. You, there's also, of course, a complete change of not only the style of government but the actual goals of government. Henry is saying very firmly there is going to be war. War is going to dominate my policy, not negotiation, not domestic security. And he's obviously doing something else is doing as politicians do even now. He's looking back to an earlier model. He is saying, I am like, not Henry VII, my father, but Henry V. He is determined to be England's second Henry V. And you see him actually consciously invoking gestures. Um, when he does actually invade France in 1513, it's on the anniversary of the Agincourt invasion. But Henry was only 17 when he became king, and to begin with, the peers resolved to bring him up in all pleasure to try and limit his power and, and retain theirs. How long did that last? I suspect that the average 17-year-old boy is pretty clear that his, own that his own inclination lies to all pleasure and jollity without, you know, solemn noblemen carefully en encouraging him in that direction. Um, I think there is no doubt that however much he enjoys pleasure, the real pleasure he wanted was the pleasure of war. And that's Henry. And I think in some ways I've probably rather revised my opinion since um, I wrote those words that you're quoting from. Henry does offer from the very beginning of his reign this absolutely clear-cut determination to fight. And he shows an astonishing ability to pursue that policy against, I think, a very significant force of his father's counsellors who are used to a very different style of royal management. Henry often is rather indifferent about policy, but once he sets his mind on something, he has that ruthlessness, that drive, and above all, that leadership quality which enables him to get it, and he shows that very early, and he shows it for war. Because the conventional view has been that Wolsey rose so fast because he took the drudgery of work off the king. I think that's true, but he takes the drudgery, above all, of executing a policy that the king has decided. Wolsey rises as the efficient manager of the First French War and the resulting diplomacy from it. And it seems to me, therefore, that the goal was set by the king what Wolsey shows himself as is an astonishingly able achiever of that goal. Now, once Wolsey is established in power, it seems to me that it becomes a much more even dialogue between the two. But there is no doubt that, to begin with, Wolsey was, in fact, a liberator of the king, but not simply a liberator of the king from work, but a liberator of the king from that restraining council of regency, if you like. The person that Henry uses to break the, if you like, the leading strings that the council imposes upon him is Wolsey. Why did he last so long? He was very good at his job. Uh, there's no doubt about that, whatever. In that sense, the revision of Wolsey is absolutely right. Um, Wolsey was an extraordinarily effective diplomatist, a very good administrator, and also, I think, a man who could match Henry's own sense of vision. We were talking before uh, about Henry as a king who sets goals. One of the things that I think is very important to understand about Henry is his determination to be seen to be great. 
And what Woolsey is able to do, I think, is to deliver the goods in some ways with a rather, rather inadequate budget. What the English quickly discover after that first intervention in 1513 is that they can't really afford large-scale war. What Woolsey and Henry do is something very remarkable. They then contrive to make peace as interesting and as effective as war. And as we've seen with the Gulf War, this is something that's actually very difficult to do. We all sat glued to our television sets, as you know, missiles stopped at traffic lights and helped old ladies across the road and then blew up ministries of information. But the moment there was peace, we lost interest. Now, what Woolsey did was to make peace fascinating with these grand ceremonies. The Field of Cloth of Gold is the most famous example. We remember the ceremony, but we forget what preceded it was a serious attempt at a treaty of universal peace, a concert of Europe. And what Woolsey is able to do is to use these grand peace initiatives, which he actually puts on the table. He'll even fight a little war to produce a big peace treaty. And he uses these peace conferences, as another very important one, in 1527, to keep England absolutely at the centre of things. And of course, this for Henry is immensely gratifying. Not only does his minister shine on these occasions, but so too, of course, does the king. And Wolsey is also capable of the grand gesture in domestic politics. And Henry obviously wanted to be great, not only abroad, but at home. And Wolsey has the ability, actually, to project royal policy in a thoroughly dramatic way. But in fact, you compared Wolsey with Harold Wilson. Uh, another politician who's very good at style, but occasionally a little weak on the substance. Um, like Harold Wilson, Wolsey's uh, ministry is filled with projects which are never quite finished. There are a great many white-hot heats of the technological revolution under, uh, under Wolsey. Lots and lots of schemes that are floated and never quite finished. Because, of course... This isn't wholly Wolsey's fault. All the time he was having to play a balancing act between domestic policy and foreign policy. You'd got one of these marvellous legal initiatives going, or you began to, you'd begun to look at the problem of enclosure, and what happens? A war breaks out. You've got then to throw all your attention on that. Because nowadays we can see how difficult governments find it to keep all the balls in the air. Imagine then when government really is virtually a one-man band. Um, Wolsey often wrote his own letters. Can you imagine a modern minister handwriting their own letters and pages after page of those letters? Government is so tiny. Wolsey went to great lengths to avoid faction, but he found that faction was finally thrust upon him by the rise of Anne Boleyn. That's right. Of course, the people who attach themselves to the royal mistress, who of course aims to be queen, are doing so because they hope they will get on. But some of them are also doing so because they see in Anne a woman who will actually achieve specific goals. One of the political goals she may achieve is destroying Wolsey. That comes. And that, of course, is as much a matter of principle as it's a matter of self-interest. The second thing she may achieve is actually altering religion because Anne identifies herself with some of the new movements in religion. So what she does, I think, is really to act as a focus for a whole series of hopes. And, but above all, why she matters, of course, is because of what Henry thinks of her. I think, really, the relationship between Henry and Wolsey had been an astonishingly intimate one. A minister in those days isn't simply a political appointment. It's also a deeply personal appointment. The letters between Henry and Wolsey have almost an element of flirtation or love about. Henry actually addresses Wolsey as your loving friend and master. In 1527, when Wolsey is sent off to negotiate with France, of course, at exactly the moment that Anne is rising in power, his letters to Henry have got a quality of a, of, of, of a man separated from his mistress. There's a passion about them. Now, obviously, of course, that emotional relationship between the master and servant is one that can be disturbed by a relationship between a master and a mistress. And that's exactly what happens. I think Anne steps into that emotional minefield and pushes Wolsey and Henry apart, and she substitutes the relationship between her and Henry for the relationship between Henry and Wolsey. But it, once again, it's a relationship which is obviously deeply passionate. Reading Henry's letters to Anne is astonishing. I think they're the only time that Henry fully reveals himself that he actually fully depended on another human being. How clever was she? Very. Uh, her worst enemy, uh, Eustace Chapuis, the imperial ambassador, says after her fall, uh, she was horrible, but she was bright. Uh, Cromwell, again, who helped to destroy her, 
says exactly the same. She was a woman with, as we would now say, real leadership quality. So much of what we see in her daughter Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, is actually there in her. She actually leads her own grouping at court. She clearly takes the initiative in the relationship with Henry. When she's rising, I think Henry finds this fascinating. Here's a woman who's dared to say no to him. Nobody had ever dared to say no to Henry before. And I, he's clearly absolutely seduced by this. But of course, when they marry, it's a very different story. The other interesting change of power is that when Wolsey fell, he was succeeded by his own secretary, Thomas Cromwell. How would you compare the two men? I think they're extraordinarily alike in most ways. One of the great problems with Tudor history has been the determination to make Wolsey and Cromwell very different. Um, is an obvious thing to do. You just look at their portraits. Wolsey in cardinalic red, Cromwell in sub-fusk black with all the papers and whatever. Wolsey with this incredible appetite for building, for pompous processions, for splendour. Cromwell rather the backroom boy. Obviously, Wolsey is a cleric. Cromwell is a layman. Wolsey is a great cleric, and he rules as a cardinal chancellor. Now, that I think... We don't really understand that. Let's ask a very simple question. Why are so many ministers in France also cardinals? The reason for it is twofold. You can actually loot the church to pay for them. That's how the English civil service was run in the later Middle Ages. And the second thing is, of course, that being a cardinal gives you rank. When a little man like Richelieu is made a cardinal, he takes precedence over all the duque pair. So he can speak first. He can actually manage the council. Exactly the same thing is true with Wolsey. When Wolsey is made a cardinal, he outranks, butcher's son though he is, even the Duke of Norfolk. So that gives you a whole style. Wolsey can be fitted, if you like, as a cardinal chancellor within a structure of aristocratic politics. Now, the great problem after the Reformation, and I think arguably the greatest consequence of the Reformation, this, this is a really controversial thing to say, is that you can't make cardinal ministers. In other words, people of humble background can't be just slotted into the system in an acceptable way. And the problem is, how does somebody like Cromwell, of Cromwell's origins, exercise power within an aristocratic structure? And the answer is he's got to do it much of the time in a more subfusk way. Moore and Cromwell were executed, and Wolsey would have been if he hadn't died first. Was that because Henry would brook neither opposition nor failure? I think there are two sides to every execution, uh, and I don't mean literally the man who was having his head cut off and those who are cutting the head off. I think that there's the king's view of what was going on, and there's also the view of the political elite. And it seems to me, for example, uh, on Wolsey's fate, that it's much of the time the political elite is rivals, people who hate him, like Norfolk, who are actually making the running. It's certainly true with Cromwell's execution, for example. We know that Norfolk not only wants Cromwell to be executed, he wants the full horror of hanging, drawing and quartering to be visited on him because he's not a nobleman and he wants to drive home the fact that he's simply a churl by having him executed as, as, as an ordinary person, not subject to the privilege of a nobleman of having those terrible penalties commuted into the, 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 mere, the mere business of cutting the head off. Um, with Moore, I think it's a different matter. With Moore, I think there's no doubt whatever that it's Henry's personal, private vindictiveness. Um, but it's a personal, private vindictiveness that arises from something very special. Now, Moore, I think, was felt by Henry to have betrayed him. Moore had been one of the people closest to Henry. There had been a, an almost stage-managed humanist model of romantic, friend, almost classical friendship, if you like, between Henry and Moore. Moore then turns against Henry. He puts his loyalty, partly to Catherine, but above all to an idea of a universal church, above his loyalty to an English king. And I think Henry can never forgive anybody who puts any loyalty above their loyalty to him. In fact, the more one reads about Henry, the more he seems to have been a monstrous tyrant. I think one can overplay it. Um, the number of executions is comparatively modest, certainly by modern standards, even by the standards of some previous English kings. Um, what I think is striking about Henry is who is executed that most of those executed are from this inner circle around the king. It's that that's decimated, sometimes more than decimated, sometimes more than one in ten actually fall. What is striking, on the other hand, about Henry is that those outside that inner circle, on the whole, are not touched. 
And if you look, for example, at the way the pilgrimage of grace is repressed in 1536, and you compare that with the way in which the other great Northern Rebellion, 1569, is suppressed, the mild Elizabeth executes or has far more ordinary people executed than the supposedly monstrous Henry. But Elizabeth, on the other hand, is extremely tender about the feelings of her servants and those that she knows. You understand? I think it's a very interesting difference that, that Henry seems to treat his ordinary subjects relatively tenderly, but is brutal to the inner circle. Elizabeth is very tender indeed, very tolerant, very understanding about the inner circle, is hesitant even to execute Mary, Queen of Scots or Norfolk, who clearly plotted against her, sometimes several times, but he's very brutal when it comes to ordinary people. It's a different style. Eventually, Elizabeth succeeded, and she seems to have been most like her father of, of all his children. Did she consolidate the Tudor Revolution? That is the question, uh, when did you stop beating your wife? It assumes that there was a Tudor Revolution. Um, in terms of the way England is governed, she couldn't for the very simple reason Henry VIII had been a great overbearing king, the epitome, whatever his performance in bed, of masculinity. Elizabeth is a woman. Now, that mere fact transforms the way England is governed, it seems to me. Elizabeth, in many ways, pretends to be a king. There are those amazing scenes at Tilbury, you'll remember, when, rather like Margaret Thatcher after the Gulf War, she appears in a kind of silvered breastplate, generally in the role of a, of a general with her troops. Again, her use of strong language, which is a, a highly mascul masculine quality, the way in which she buffets her ministers. All of this is a queen being a king. So the style has to be very different. That's one point. The second thing is, it seems to me that what Elizabeth does governmentally is very different. Henry's government is a government which always has the political initiative about marriage, about war, about peace, about religion. Elizabeth almost consciously refuses the initiative. She does not want to marry. She does not want to name her successor. She does not want to fight a war. She does not want to change religion. And this extraordinary negativity of royal policy, I think, in a sense, hands the political initiative to others, to others of the Queen's subjects who do want to do something. And Elizabeth finds herself all the time acting as a kind of a dam against other forces, whereas Henry had been leading forward, Elizabeth saying, no, 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 stop here. So which of the Tudors has left us the most durable legacy? I would still plump for Henry VIII. It's a legacy of enormous weight, negatively and positively. Those ruins of the monasteries, I think, still stand. There's a deep irony here. Henry builds 55 palaces, of which only fragments of two survive. He demolishes the monasteries, but literally hundreds of those ruins still stand. And they stand there as an extraordinarily important punctuation point in English history. So there's that immense sense of, if you like, a line being drawn under the past. A line being drawn under the past, which f for all Mary's attempts and whatever, could not be undone. So, but there's much more to it than that. It seems to me, even if we look at positive achievements, the reign of Henry VIII has extraordinary significance. In one sense, his separation from Rome, his creation of the Church of England, above all, the invention of the royal supremacy, the supremacy of the king over the church, something we always forget in our anxiety to, anal to, to ask, is he Protestant, is he Catholic, or what? Uh, the royal supremacy. These things, it seemed to me, set England off, or rather they reinforce a tendency of England to have a separate path of development to continental Europe. In a sense, the reign of Henry VIII set us off. It didn't take us a whole of the way. It didn't invent the British Empire. None of that is true. But it sets us off in a distinctly different line of development, which, in a sense, we've only reversed in the later 20th century. We broke with Rome in the reign of Henry VIII. We signed the Treaty of Rome in the late 20th century. And we are, if you like, readjusting ourselves back into a series of European realignments, but we're finding it difficult to do so. And one of the reasons we're finding it so difficult is that that separate development, which is so intensified by Henry, means that we are very different from Europe. Our laws are different, our attitudes to state authority, citizenship and whatever are different, and so many of those differences are rooted then in the early 16th century. What did you mean when you said that to transfer from Tudor Whitehall to the modern White House requires little more than a change of clothes? 
exactly what it says. That's to say that I think that nearly all high politics is the same in all periods. And only the, if you like, the externals of language and of dress actually change. But if you look at government, I would argue that almost all government has a tendency to become monarchy be they called presidents or be they called prime ministers. Monarchs always have courts, and if you look at the development of the White House staff, or indeed the development of the um, Downing Street staff, you will actually see that these, these private advisors, these, the, the, these Inghams and whatever, um, these, these Kissingers and whatever, occupy precisely the position of the grooms of the stool of the Tudor period. They are the monarch's inner advisors, uh, the president, the prime minister's inner advisors. They often uh, occupy positions which have no constitutional standing, but yet enjoy enormous power. They control access. They control patronage. They control, above all, that flow of information, that flow of private information on which public decisions will be taken. And I think we need increasingly to see with modern governments, too, this parallelism of the formal structures, the formal structures of Whitehall, the Pentagon or whatever, and then the informal structures, which concentrate round the ruler, round the prime minister, the president, as a genuine court and create, in fact, all the pressures of court politics, because, after all, there's been no better example of court politics in all their nastiness, their viciousness, and their ostentation than the fall of Margaret Thatcher. So what lessons can we still learn from the Tudors? That's one of them. Guard your back. Um, the Tudors, it seems to me, offer um, politics in the absolute and undisguised raw. It's no accident that these men are contemporaries of Machiavelli. If you want to see how high politics operates, how self, that strange mingling of self-interest and principle, it seems to me the politics of the Tudor court, and particularly the politics of Henry VIII's reign, are fascinating. They're universal. They can be applied in all directions. I have, in fact, done training seminars for businessmen based on this, and they've been absolutely delighted. God knows what's happened, and maybe the recession is all a result of that, but never mind. Why is it important to read or to write history? To avoid the vice of timism, to present to us an alternative way of doing things. I think in the 20th century you've become very aware that we are not the centre of the universe, that if you look at the way the Victorians wrote history, they assumed that all history was leading up to them, and they, in a sense, stood as the pinnacle of perfection. History, therefore, was a tale of progress leading up to them as the culmination of progress. Obviously... Uh, particularly in a country like England, where we've seen there's a thing called decline as well as a thing called progress and development, we've rejected that. Instead now, I think, we can see human difference. We are all now very aware of different cultural values. We've institutionalised things like racism, the, the fact that racism is a bad thing. We can see the different values that are accorded to sex and sexuality, and we recognise that that is a good thing. But what I think we also need to recognise are the different values of different periods of time, and that they offer genuinely different ways of doing things and different sets of values which are equally valid as our own. Obviously, the Tudor period, I think, offers two very important sets of values, both of which are rather in dispute in the 20th century, late 20th century. If you like, it offers a nakedness of competition, a determination to get on, to get, to make, to do, that makes most modern capitalism seem extraordinarily weak and wishy-washy and rather shy. It has, if you like, that nakedness, that almost savagery of vitality of getting on. And secondly, of course, in a completely opposite sense, it emphasises the importance of hierarchy, of order, of subordination. And it seems to me that a society that can contain these two wildly different value sets and contain them in some reasonable stability is a society that has got an enormous amount to teach us. Not to imitate, but to see different ways of doing things. And that's what history is about. It's about seeing different ways of doing things. It's like travel. The famous phrase of the past is another country. They do things differently there. We should be intelligent tourists in the other country of the past. In the last of his conversations with historians, John Miller has been talking to Dr David Starkey, lecturer in Tudor history at the London School of Economics and Political Science. The producer in Bristol was John Knight.